Welcome to the SEI's podcast series, a production of Carnegie Mellon University's Software Engineering Institute. My name is Will Hayes. I'm a principal engineer at the Software Engineering Institute, and it's my privilege today to interview a colleague of mine from the Emerging Technology Center, Mr. Jared Edinger. Jared, welcome. Hi, Will. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background, where you come from? Yeah, sure. So I had about 14 years of intelligence. Um, analysis and counterintelligence analysis and operational support um, for the government. I worked in D.C. for a while and um, earlier this year in January I moved up to Carnegie Mellon, Pittsburgh and working at the Software Engineering Institute now. So. Great. And so your field of work is in cyber intelligence in our emerging, emerging technology center. That's right. And we want to make sure we differentiate um, cyber intelligence from cyber security, which is probably a term most people have heard a lot more of. Yeah. Could you help with that? So the way we here at the SCI at least define cyber intelligence is the acquisition of uh, information to identify, track, or predict the, the cyber um, capabilities and actions of malicious actors to offer courses of action to decision makers to enhance or protect their organization. So the long and short of that is, is basically cyber intelligence is more like a subset of cybersecurity. It mm. can be a force multiplier to your overall cybersecurity picture um, or platform for your organization. Um, it's something that you're looking internally in your network and outside in the world to figure out, okay, what's going on in my network and outside in the world that I could use to um, provide some analysis and communicate that effectively to a decision maker uh, that could enhance our cybersecurity for our entire organization. So I guess when most lay people think of cybersecurity, they think exclusively of how computers operate and firewalls and technical details. Yeah. Uh, the way you've just described cyber intelligence, it really is the many different modes of information gathering and processing. Yeah, I mean, you would have, you'd probably want to start off with like, what, what are the needs or priority, priorities for your organization? Um, and then once you understand what those needs are, you're going to need to collect information to, to, to figure out, okay, w you know, this is what I need to know. Now I need to go get that information and that information comes from yeah inside your network there's logs um, that all that data that you're getting from your sim or your DLP or your IPS or your IDS and then going out into the world and figuring out okay what else is going on where there's geopolitical relationships where you have business mergers or um, any type of um, situations going on with the supply chains out in the world or even cultures that your organizations might operate in or have people or as employees to figure out okay this this makes sense and this this is part of my analysis and how I want to um, um, communicate that to a decision maker. So the wide open nature of the field as you've described it seems really fitting for our emerging technology center where we're really trying to be on the leading edge when things develop and find new applications and, and new uses for technology and, and methodologies that come about. Yeah. Could you give examples of uh, maybe a kind of fusion that, that you've seen in your realm? Yeah, so some of the things that we're looking at at the Emerging Technology Center is you know, advanced computing, applied um, applied analytics, um, machine learning, and so what we, some of the things that we like to do with cyber intelligence is explore some of the newest and greatest technologies that are out there, whether it's be machine learning, natural language processing, IoT, um, even um, augmented reality and virtual reality, and try to figure out, okay, where, does cyber intelligence have a place in that, and can those be a force multiplier for cyber intelligence uh, and to help an organization, you know, um, with its entire cybersecurity platform. So those are things that we're exploring and are interested in um, and looking at right now. So certainly being housed within Carnegie Mellon University, a lot yeah. of the fields you just mentioned are really frontiers that other um, staff yeah. at Carnegie Mellon are pursuing. That's right. I mean, that's one of the great things about working here is that we have um, either the smartest person in the world working on some of that you know, technology right now, or they know the smartest person in the world, and we can tap into that and leverage that research and their creativity. So yeah. And so I understand that a model of um, work and transition that you're pursuing and have had some great experience with is this uh, formation of a consortium that you've been working with. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you bet. So the consortium basically started, there's kind of a backstory to it. So in about 2012, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence came to the SCI and was like, hey, what's really going on in cyber intelligence out there in the world? Are there any best practices that we can learn here in the government? So uh, the OD&I came to us and we did a study and that study is called the Cyber Intelligence Tradecraft Project and that study basically went from 2012 to mid-2013 
where we went out and um, met with a number of organizations, government, industry, and academia, and we, we met with them and interviewed them and learned uh, what kind of cyber intelligence are they doing right now, what does their program look like, what are the best practices and challenges they have, and then we wrote up a study um, for the DNI. So after that study was done, and that study included things like you know implementation, collection management strategies, prior, how do you prioritize threats, how do you how do you train your analysts? Here's some of the best practices, et cetera, in cyber intelligence. But after, after that study was done, a number of those organizations that we met with were like, hey, we really like this idea of collaboration and communicating with each other. Is there some form that we can continue this and, can, and keep this going? So that basically started the consortium. And that, that, that initiative and, and drive to do that started the consortium in June 2014 timeframe. So um, that's what the consortium, how it started. And what we do is we basically provide a forum for um, not just not sharing indicators of compromise, that's really not what it's not about. It's a mm -hmm. forum for sharing hey, best practices and learning from each other and learning new technologies, what's going on in the world and how they can apply that to their cyber intelligence program. The other thing about the, the consortium is it's a venue to train. Mm -hmm. So we provide um, workshops where the, the people that are doing cutting edge work in the field can come um, and, and, and lecture and, and teach uh, members about what's going on in cyber intelligence, whether it is IoT, whether it is AR or VR. Um, and we also have these simulations that we run. And that's kind of one of the main things that we work on as part of the consortium of these simulations where it's a, um, it's, it's a threat scenario mm -hmm. where um, you can have a physical aspect to it, but also a cyber aspect to it. And um, analysts come, or mem members send their analysts come to get training and, and have to, to diagnose or navigate through you know, a very fast-paced um, threat scenario and have to provide uh, recommendations to management. So on how it's kind of like a capture the flag, but you much more it. complex it's and very, reverse. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's very complex, and we make it complex on purpose hmm. um, to, to give it kind of like a real-world situation where they have a limited amount of time frame to um, navigate through all the ambiguity that we give them, connect the dots, and try to make some recommendation that will stop the threat from happening in the time frame that they have. Um, and so they get experience hands-on with tools, and they get to hear about um, related scenarios. Yeah, so they're getting hands-on experience with tools, um, and also the intelligence analysis, counterintelligence, and also being able to communicate effectively, hmm. um, and to brainstorm also, and think about how to th go about approaching a problem, how to problem solve. So one of the things that we do as part of our training are these human-centered design techniques where um, you know the, the participants get to think out loud and can communicate each other in ways that they might not necessarily do on their own, but okay. through um, collective thinking and, and some um, affinity clustering or things like that or bullseye diagrams. We can, we can get the participants to think of some pretty creative ideas on how to navigate through that threat, but it's also just not tools and you know analysis. It's also some of those softer skills, being able to communicate, being able to um, collaborate with other people on some of the toughest challenges you know when it comes to cyber so you're doing more than helping people assimilate new techniques and new ways of doing things you're helping them to train their approach and the human side of it in a yeah. way that you might not get from classes and books and such venues. Yeah, yeah, because you could be the greatest cyber intel analyst in the world, but if you're unable to communicate with your findings um, effectively to management, it really doesn't matter. Mm. And all of this in the context of uh, where emerging technologies are being harnessed. And yeah. So you have a fairly diverse set of participants in this consortium, industry and government? We do. Yeah. Um, it can, it's government, industry, and academia. Okay. Um, have been have joined in the past. So without naming any of them, could you speak a little bit about the differences in perspectives that those different kinds of organizations bring to the table? Um, I would say that they're all kind of trying to figure out when it comes to specifically hiring. You mm -hmm. know, who, who do you who do you really hire? Do you hire the IT um, very technical person that doesn't understand really or have that experience with intel analysis and how to critically think and connect dots, um, or do you hire? Um, the individual that is the intel analyst and train them on IT, um, or do you hire just the generalist? And that really, that, that's a problem space that really hasn't been solved yet. Mm. Um, and I don't think there ever will be a solution because it kind of all depends on the organization and kind of what, what their needs are. But that's something that um, we've seen across government, industry, and academia. They just don't know which, which is, is there a right answer? And, and quite frankly, there really isn't. So I've, I've heard in different domains, it's, it's better to hire a people person and train them in the technology. Other domains, it's better to hire someone who's very well versed in the technology and help them get more effective at the people skills. This is an unsolved 
question at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I mean, it all it kind of all depends on what you need for your organization. I mean, for me and my learning curve, it was the intel and the counter intel, and then try to get smart technically, mm -hmm. and that's worked fairly well. Um, but as long as you could have, you know, I think I think the, a good thing to have for any analyst is um, getting into this field is at least you know a breadth of knowledge um, on a number of technical issues and then have at least one or two verticals where you're really really good at right or, mm -hmm. or at least you can say like I can speak to someone in this field I kind of understand what they're saying but when it comes to this particular area I got a ton of vertical on it and I could talk to it and so putting people with the various skills in those different verticals in the same room and having them do these simulations, there's some magic that occurs. Yeah, I mean, we, we try to generate that magic by putting um, people with different skill sets and different backgrounds um, together and make them work together. Mm. Um, and we also, what we try to do is um, purposely put information out there that would make them want to communicate with each other oh. and whether that's true information misleading information something that will happen force them to get up from their chairs and talk to talk to each other and say are you, hey are you seeing this does this make sense did you try this tool what do you think about this and to have those discussions so that they can provide a decision maker with you know a comprehensive analysis um, when they come to that point so having read some of the feedback you've received from past workshop it seems like this is something you spend considerable time preparing for and the depth and breadth of what you're covering in these workshops is yeah I mean it's it's a long process to prepare for the simulations that we do um, for the one that we just ran in August of this year that process started in January. We come up with the storyline with you know we do the, um, in collaboration with CERT also as mm. part of the SCI and they're they're very helpful in, in running the simulation. But the process really starts in January, so I can tell you that from the first simulation we ran um, early, early days of the consortium, that basically had 50 intelligence reports that analysts had to sift through. Mm. Right. So for the second time we did the simulation, we had over 100, okay. and they have to just go through, and they're being flooded with reports that they're going to have to, you know, figure out and dissect in a very short period of time. So there's a time pressure. Yeah, there's okay. a time pressure. So um, okay. it's pretty cool. It's fun. It's exciting. It's one of my, you know, most enjoyable parts of, of the job. So. Okay. Yeah. So what other offerings uh, beyond this uh, do you have in yeah. your future? So I mentioned that we have um, the workshops, right, where we bring um, some of the the leading edge um, people doing research and and cyber intelligence we have they can come and talk um, at these workshops and the members also come and talk about hey this is these are some of the challenges that we're having or some of the things that we've learned and they share and they collaborate that way one of the other things that we do here um, at the SEI is we build prototypes hmm. so if a uh, if a member were to come to us and say hey we really have this idea for a tool but we just don't have the bandwidth um, to do it right now with the resources or we really want this there's new technology out there We know it exists, but we can't we, we can't have the, the resources and time to get to it Can you help us with that? So part of the thing with the ETC emerging technology something we do is that t technology transition, right? So we will help them build that prototype and spend the time to, to get it to where they want um, And demonstrate that so that it can be customizable for when we can deliver it to the to the member So this subject of tools is a perennial struggle for a federally funded research and development center We mm -hmm. often find ourselves having to tell our customers it would be inappropriate for us to endorse one tool or another It sounds like in the space you're working it's not even that simple that um, off-the-shelf tools may not serve the same kind of role in the technology area you're talking about contrasted with others so this experience of using tools and building them together is a much richer part of your interaction yeah with I mean so you're right like so we don't endorse any tool over another um, but if a customer came to us and said hey we had this really good idea for um, a tool is this something that you might be able to help us with so I can give you two examples um, one example was a um, members came to us and said hey we had a we were really interested in a, some way to better prioritize threats is this something that you can help us with so we were able to build something that could help them do that hmm. um, additionally there was you know how do you select a vendor right was the was the problem and you know there's so many threat feeds that are coming in there's so many vendors that are offering threat feeds how does one organization select one vendor over another vendor um, so what we helped it was not only build a framework for helping them to go through that decision tree but also a tool that could help them um, figure out okay I have this much money um, this is what my, my the, what I need for my tool. Um, this is the space that's out there. Um, this is the time frame in which I need it, and, and, and they can better select the tool that way. And I suspect in, in the context of a consortium where we have information being protected and, and people's concerns addressed carefully, 
being able to share that conversation with more than one organization and have them learn from each other is probably a very powerful source. Yeah, I mean, that's what the, uh, that's what the, the greatest thing about the consortium is, is that the ability of the members to collaborate and talk with each other. And again, it's not about sharing indicators of compromise. It's sharing, like, this is what works for us, or these are some of the challenges we have. How have you guys addressed this problem? Um, and that's some of the, that's the members drive the consortium, and you know it's how much the consortium thrives, how, how much the members want to put into it, and they put a lot into it because they really do care about this problem. Mm. And so the way we staff our emerging technology center uh, has to be mindful of this. Uh, so people with uh, experience like yours really are needed to play this role. And um, you're not a person simply learned in a particular topic area as a university professor. You have more than that, you've kind of been there and, and seen the real world situations. Yeah. You have um, a number of colleagues um, who share that kind of experience. Could you talk a bit about the diversity of experience? Yeah, experiences? so we have, um, you know, not only the members have their own a ton of experience there, but within the SEI and the ETC, we have your really technical folks. Um, you have someone like me that has more of an intel counterintelligence background. Um, you have data scientists, you have um, individuals that are really smart when it comes to cybersecurity, people that are just, you know, strict researchers that are really good at researching things. We do, we have people that are experts when it comes to biometrics, mm. um, when it comes to machine learning. Um, so we, we use all of their knowledge and brain power um, to, try to, to, to try to help the consortium and bring whatever knowledge we can to, to help the consortium in their problem space move forward. And so there are other publications, um, webinars, podcasts um, that cover a great um, breadth of this experience, and I would encourage viewers um, yeah. to pursue that. Uh, have you got uh, a particular thing out on the SCI's website you'd like to plug? It's uh, funny you mention that. So yeah, so we're we're going to be going around doing these information sessions to to, to get the word out um, more about the more about the consortium. We have um, uh, an information session planned in DC. Um, October 28th is the date, um, so if people can come, that would be great. It's, if you go to our website, if you, you on the SEI main page, you'll see a link to it, um, and you can register for that. We're also tentatively planning to go to uh, New York and Chicago as well to get hold these information sessions. So, we're, um, so far we've got great. It looks like we have great turnout coming for the one in DC. So we expect, um, hopefully, can expect the same for New York and Chicago. Terrific. Yeah. So in addition to the offerings we've talked about, um, is there educational um, opportunities people could pursue with you? Yeah, well, um, actually I teach a introduction to cyber intelligence class here as part of the Information Networking Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Great. Um, it's, a graduate, it's a graduate level course. Um, in terms of the consortium though, um, what we've been working on doing is getting consortium members um, access to per particular slides mm. um, of that course. Um, so it's something that, um, as we move forward with the consortium, we wanted to, as, you know, make sure that consortium members get some of that material because, you know, our goal it really is training um, and education. So if we can um, extend what I'm teaching at the course uh, in some variety to the members, then that's something that we want to do. So at this point in time, it looks like consortium members will have access to certain slides um, um, as part of that class. Okay, great. Thanks very much for coming in. It's my this pleasure. Very you bet. Interesting. Yeah. This podcast is available on the Software Engineering Institute's website, as well as on Carnegie Mellon University's iTunes U site. As always, if you have any questions about this subject matter, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you.